Good afternoon, everyone. Here we are today, January 15th, and Rob is moderating another conference for ISNR. So it's just us and all of us. And I'm not going to waste too much time. I don't think Richard's unmuting anybody. He's going to talk today about one of my favorite topics. Are you unmuting people or are we going to do the I am. This is not going to be a formal, I'll do a Good. formal presentation, but I don't feel I know enough about what I don't know. Uh, you know, people out there are confused, so confused about this topic. I don't think I understand the full depth of the confusion. So I want to hear what people, questions they want to ask and what they want to say. Perfect. So we're going to get started. And um, I'm excited too, because I'm doing more of this bipolar montage training um, with people with intense trauma backgrounds that when they talk with me about that. So I'm thrilled that we're doing this today, Richard. So go on ahead. I'm, muting yeah, myself. Mike, I'm still unmuting. We've got quite a few people today. I, I see, this Yay. is a big, it's a big topic, and uh, yeah. I didn't even know it was that big a topic. And oh, my goodness. So yeah. I have to preface all this by saying, you know, um, in neurofeedback, for over a decade, maybe, bipolar montage was not used much or talked about much. It was kind of an old thing that people used to do, um, except there were a few people like Seaburn Fisher uh, who continued to do it. And the Othamers do it, but they do it with InfraSlow. So they kind of left traditional bipolar montage co concepts behind when they went into InfraSlow. But the hookup is the same. And I think that's where people are getting confused. Bipolar is a montage. We call it bipolar training, but bipolar is a montage. It's not a method in a sense. I mean, it, it gets reified into a, a method in a sense. And so I think it gets, causes a lot of confusion. We also have a lot of confusion because um, of the way we set the new mind amplifiers and training up. Our goal was to make learning neurofeedback as simple, as easy to do and learn, and as um, uh, error-free as possible. In order to do that, we had to simplify our explanation, and we had to simplify the amplifier, and we had to simplify the software, because too many people were so completely lost and too many people were making errors because to understand neurofeedback and amplifiers, you have to understand electronics to some degree and electronic theory to some degree. And you have to, um, if you don't, you're gonna make a lot of errors. To avoid that, most clinicians are not good at learning electronic theory and a lot of them don't want to and it's off-putting and I don't want to do this new technology if I have to learn electronic theory. In order to encourage people in, in the non-engineering uh, technical community, people who are doing psychology and social work and counseling, in order to aid and assist them in using this technology, um, that we had to simplify it. We had to, in a sense, simplify your desktop, remove some of your apps, and make it really, you know, um, very basic. And when we did that, we did certain things to the amplifiers and the software to do that. So most of you do two-channel protocols. Some of you understand how to do one and two-channel protocols, just some of you come from other systems like Brain master people come over here from Brain master and say, oh my God, this is so much simpler, thank you. And it is, but there's sacrifices you make for simple. And that's always the case. And your hope is that uh, as you all get more sophisticated, you know, you, you take your CEs and you learn more, that um, you can use the software in different ways. But to do that, you know, you have to study, you have to take workshops, you have to learn. 
So you can't just say, I'm going to do bipolar montage um, and think that, you know, you're going to, it's going to be the same as like doing two channel on our system. It's not. And in fact, traditional one channel, if you want to do traditional one channel, you know, there's new mind one channel, but if you want to do traditional one channel, you have to unlink the ears in the software. And a lot of you don't even know there's a place in the software to unlink. And we hit it there on purpose so that a lot of you wouldn't get um, existential angst looking at that drop down menu and you didn't know what it meant, or that you played with it and you didn't know what you were doing, or you thought you knew what you were doing and you were using it and it wasn't what you thought you were doing. So to make sure that we get consistent data into our system, which benefits you in the long run, and to make everything simple, we had to do something called linked ears. So your software, the new mind software, has the ears linked internally. Okay. And what that does is it means that the values you see on your trend screen, if alpha says 10 microvolts on your trend screen, that's the same on the brain map. If you unlink the ears, it may not be the same because the brain map was recorded with link ears. If you want to train based on those values and compare them, you have to train with linked ears. The other problem is that in traditional neurofeedback, you always have to put the reference lead. And there's only one in single channel, traditional single channel. You only have one reference. It always has to go on the same ear. If you switch ears, you'll get profoundly different results in the, in the amplitude. And that will mislead you and your client and confuse everybody and you'll get everything wrong. Now, hopefully that's not causing too much angst to you right now hearing that because um, you may have been doing something differently and didn't know. And that's why you have to take workshops and ask questions. If you've been doing standard two channel protocols and one channels with the new mind software, the new mind way, it's very difficult to make errors or screw things up and that's why we did it but if you start doing bipolar training using a if you start training EEG with a bipolar montage everything changes you have to make a lot of modifications and think about things differently so we bring on Seaburn Fisher and she talks about training well she doesn't know She's not a technician. She doesn't know what Tom Kalur and I know, and she even tells you that, but you probably didn't hear her telling you that. And she doesn't know that you don't know. She assumes you know what, how she's, what a bipolar montage is and how she's doing it. She's not a technician. She says, that's your problem, not her problem. And so some of you may be thinking you're doing a bipolar montage and you're not, or you may not even know what it is, or you may say, I don't want to mess with what Seaburn's doing because I don't get what that thing is. I mean, there's lots of th things that could arise here. But since Bessel van der Kolk stepped into the picture and was doing stuff with Seaburn, now everything's getting really confusing. Um, and everybody wants to know about Seaburn's protocol. And there's a whole history to it. And that's a problem. You all don't. Even if you know what bipolar is, you don't, still don't know what Seaburn's doing. Because Seaburn's not even doing traditional bipolar training. She's doing something that the Othmers invented around the year 2000, 2001. And they ran workshops at BrainMaster for many years with this special kind of software setup that BrainMaster helped them evolve. And they used a special and they used bipolar montage to do it with. So they had two radically different things going on. And you got to remember, these are the people who said the only way to do neurofeedback is monopolar and anything else is crazy. And then suddenly in 2000, 2001, they went like, we're doing bipolar, everybody. This is the new thing. And we had some people jump on board and we had people who first came into neurofeedback. They didn't know there was anything else. So they just did what the Othmers told them. This happens all the time in our field and in other fields. So they came into Brain Master. They said, this is called a bipolar montage. They may not have even mentioned it. 
I, as I recall, they did, but most people didn't even understand what that meant. And they said, this is how you hook somebody up. And then here's the software. But the software setup was so unusual and so radically different that Tom Clore and I had to sit down and talk about it for a while to see if it was even valid. We were pulling our hair and said, I don't know if you can do this. So Tom sat down, scratched around, and we yammered at each other, and we said, yeah, I guess you can. It's a really weird way to do it, but you can do this. Um, and it's even in Tom's book on um, uh, his technical book, Tec Technical Foundations of Neurofeedback, he mentions it a little bit in one paragraph, so you wouldn't even know. Because that's most people aren't doing what the authors were doing in 2001, 2002. They, they aren't doing it anymore. There are people still doing it, and they love it. But it was causing tremendous side effects. And the people at BrainMaster got so worried about the liabilities because people were coming into workshops and having tachycardia and um, and profuse sweating and nausea. They were getting all these intense physiological symptoms from this new kind of protocol. Well, there are some people in neurofeedback are like, well, this is great. My God, it's so powerful. Now we've really got something. Uh, you can feel it intensely and immediately right away. Well, the problem is not everybody did. Some people just sat there like a stone and said, I don't get it. But other people, and Rob will tell you stories, you know, he was, he was getting manic. And uh, he said, stop doing this. It's just making me manic. Um, uh, and so people were having a lot of intense. So this new type of protocol, that's the time when Sieber and Fisher and Sue Othmer got together, and I remember I was at the work, I was at the uh, conferences and all the discussion around going on at the time. That's when Seaburn Fisher started saying, "I'm using this protocol to work with trauma," and everybody was getting interested in trauma. And this was something besides Alpha Theta. So now we have the new restaurant is opened up in town, and everybody's going to run over and eat at the new restaurant. Um, and that was Seaburn's trauma workshop. So everybody ran over there and she's doing um, the uh, Othmer style protocol. Now, Seaburn has modified it and does slight variations on it. And so to know exactly what she's doing, you need, you need to go to her workshop. And so uh, as I'm walking through this, if you see anything different that she's doing, feel free to speak up because we want to sort this out with you guys to make sure that you understand um, what's going on here. There's bipolar training, and then there's Seaburn's bipolar training. And um, those aren't the same thing, exactly. They're Dr. similar. Dr. Suter? Yes. Mark Smith with his infra low is also, uh, or infra slow is also uh, bipolar. Yes, yes, but I'm, I don't wanna get into that. His is more straightforward. It's not the old Othmer version. He's doing. Uh, he's doing. Correct, correct. But he uses all of those uh, sympathetic uh, variances as indications yes, of, yes, of when I, you're honing in. So uh, totally. But, but his totally workshop true. he covers it. But he's getting that effect because he's using infra slow. If you just do standard bipolar, traditional bipolar montage, single channel bipolar montage training, you aren't going to get those effects. If you're doing infra slow with bipolar montage, you will get those effects. If you do the old Othmer style training with bipolar montage, you will get those effects. So there's a difference here. And it's not in the montage. The difference is in how you're processing the signals in your computer. I'll say that again. The difference is not in the montage. It's not because you're doing bipolar. The difference is because of the way you're processing the signals in the computer. Oh, exactly correct. Because the early SMR training was was with bipolar. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, a lot of people were doing SMR bipolar montage, and they didn't know the difference between bipolar SMR and monopolar SMR. Um, that was really troublesome. I can remember workshops at Brain Masters when you know when we started. Brain Master started doing workshops. I was one of their first people doing workshops with them. We were seeing people pull out their hair and crying, trying to understand the difference between monopolar SMR and bipolar SMR. They would go nuts because they weren't trained to think of it. So I don't know how far we'll get today, but since it's now popular again, 
it's the new restaurant to eat in, and everybody's running over to do Seaburn's protocol. Um, we'll go over it. But I want you to go back and listen to Seaburn's last lecture and her telling you that it's not the neurofeedback that's so important, it's the clinician and the counseling that's the most important. The neurofeedback is very helpful, it's adjunctive, but it is not the center of her perspective. Don't take my word for it, go back and listen to her, her video on it. She's a counselor first and a neurofeedback clinician second. You know, so, in her lectures, like when at ISNR, mm -hmm. she spent, of let's say the hour, she talked about the literal neurofeedback placements for maybe 10 minutes. Yeah. The rest was all about the therapy and using the neurofeedback mm -hmm. with the therapy and then yes. the practical. And when I went to a two day in person with her, I'd say at least 65, 70% was on the therapy and not on the placement and what to do with the neurofeedback. Thank so you. So very consistent about that. Well, then you can keep us keep us between the rails as we go through this since you've been to her workshops. <laughs> and of course, it's it's just like a good foundation on a building. It's just that when you read all these studies, you have to read the method sections and find out what what are they measuring, you know, mm -hmm. to better understand the results. Exactly, and uh, and and you got Mark some what you're calling flashcards, the stuff that you're going to post so that everybody to also help with all of this stuff. Great. So okay, so let's kind of get a little bit started. See how far we get. We have no no fixed agenda. This could be a discussion that moves beyond just this one day. And at one point, when we get it all crowdsourced together, we'll make just one lecture and put it up on YouTube. Um, so, bipolar montage, there's another name for it, just to make things even more confusing, it's called sequential montage. And there was a war in neurofeedback in the late 90s between the people who wanted to call it sequential montage and people who wanted to call it bipolar montage. And uh, the whole thing was back to uh, the Lilliputians and their war with their friends because they cracked the egg on the wrong side. And, uh, in, or in the middle, you know, it's these are the things we get into. Um, so there, you had that little war going on. So it was used prolifically in neurofeedback in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Why? Well, back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we had what were known as crap amplifiers. Yes, you heard me, crap amplifiers. They were made with analog components. They're totally different technology than today. And um, they use simple transistors, and I'll show you that in a minute. And they had terrible input impedance, which means it was hard to get a good EEG signal. There was a lot of noise, and it's very difficult just to get a decent signal. But if you used a bipolar montage, you could get a cleaner signal. So people liked using bipolar montage back in those days um, because they got a nice clean signal uh, when you had crappy amplifiers. Um, the other thing was that they also realized at a certain point later on, uh, probably more around 98, 99, some of the people, particularly at Lexicor, began to realize, well, uh, we only have single channel amplifiers because that's all anybody had back then. There weren't any two channel amplifiers around for the most part. It was just single channel and they were expensive enough and so um, people were saying well we can't do coherence training because suddenly we had all these people coming in uh, uh, into the meeting suddenly saying coherence is the new way it's everybody needs to go to coherence that's gonna fix everything it's the final solution it was the new restaurant in town so everybody ran over there and said, yes, we must have coherence training. But our problem is, is nobody's got two channel amplifiers or very few people. Of course, if you had spent your twelve or $15,000 back in that day, which was worth all, was more like spending 25 or 30, um, if you had bought your um, 20 channel Lexcore amp and they were like the people who were making it for neurofeedback community, um, then uh, 
you could do coherence training. But the poor, impoverished, everyday uh, counselors and social workers said, well, we've only got one channel and we can't afford uh, spending that kind of money. Um, they said, well, there's a solution you can do bipolar montage. It's like, oh, we're safe. Salvation is here. And so they used bipolar montage to do coherence training. And you go like, you're going like, what? What are you talking about? Well, stick with me for a while and I'll explain to you how that's done. And you probably really don't want to know most of you, but I'm going to explain it for those of you who want to struggle for the solution there. Okay. I already told you about the Othmers. Um, and uh, we use it, Rob and I use two channel bipolar montage, which is going to blow your mind. Don't even try to think about it yet till you master the concept of bipolar. We used it uh, extensively early on. Uh, in fact, we were the first people to really standardize monopolar and use it in two channels and use it for training. It wasn't our original idea. We got the idea from David Kaiser, who's an incredibly brilliant and innovative guy who most of you may not even know exists anymore. He's not around the conferences very much, but he was the guy who ran the database for Barry Sturman, and he was the guy who came up with um, another version of connectivity monitoring other than coherence, which some of you may or may not know about, and it's co-variation of amplitude. Um, so they, uh, that's a completely different concept than coherence. And they were promoting, Barry Stern was promoting that. And David went on to produce a whole raft of other neurometric dimensions. He was brilliant at math and stats. And um, of course, that immediately overwhelmed everybody. And they said, just we don't want to look at that. And then you had competition, people like Thatcher and Hudspeth and other people saying, well, that's bogus. The real thing, the thing to do is what we've always done, which is coherence phase, you know, symmetry. And David Kaiser's going like, there's more, there's more. And they're saying, no, no, go home, go home. So David kind of more or less intellectually got drummed out of the field to some degree. This happens in every field. It happened with quantum mechanics and physics from 1902, you know, when we started off uh, identifying with Max Planck and Einstein identifying uh, photons as uh, not waves but particles and treating them that way uh, and bouncing them off electrons. Suddenly, that just threw the world of physics and everybody fought and bitter battles and on and on. It happens in every field. So then we get. Um, uh, the fact that it actually diminished in popularity eventually. As QEEG came into the field, everybody started looking at monopolar training uh, more, as more narrowly the way to do it. Because uh, if you had monopolar linked ears, then your values on your cues would be the same values as on your trend screen. And people like that because they were looking at the brain map and they're saying like, wow, the alpha looks really high. But when I look on my uh, bipolar montage um, trend screen, it doesn't look that high. What's going on? Or you may have had the ears linked one. You may have not had the ears linked, but one day you have your reference on one ear and, you know, and it's ipsilateral and it's at 10 microvolts. And then you put it on the contralateral ear and, other, and the next time all of a sudden uh, it's at 16 microvolts or 18 microvolts, and you don't know why it changed, you're attributing it to the neural feedback. You're saying, wow, this person got better or worse, and all you did was shift the reference from one ear to the other. So everybody's saying, you know what, we really should be using linked ears and monopolar because we're all using maps, and then BrainMaster brought in Z-score training. Well, now you absolutely have to have linked ears for that. And so they came out with their new 19 channel amp and it was linked internally. And electronics had changed in EEG. We were no longer linking ears physically. We were linking them internally, electronically with the software. Well, of course, almost nobody in the field knew that except Tom and me and a few people and people are building amplifiers and writing software. So hopefully you're getting a sense of how confusing and varied all these things were. 
and uh, so on. And I just said, nope, we're going to make this as simple as possible and as uniform as possible. Um, bipolar montage continued to be used by Seaburn and continued to be used by people that the Othmers trained but didn't want to follow the Othmers into InfraSlow. So the Othmers moved into InfraSlow through the bipolar montage doorway and went into InfraSlow, but they left a massive number of people who still liked that original way they were teaching in 2001, 2002, 2003, what, around that period. And they, uh, uh, so they're out there and they're, most of them are using the EEG, the EEGers they call themselves. Um, and uh, that company running EEGers was the company that went bankrupt uh, and bought out the Othmers, it's actually the executives, that drove the company into bankruptcies. The Othmers lost their house and everything left. And then those people, those business managers came back and bought EEG Spectrum out of bankruptcy and became known as EEG. I mean, these little ugly facts that nobody talks about, you never hear about in the history. Um, but uh, if you're eating dinner with all these people, it's some of it's heart-wrenching. So that's why the authors went and worked with BrainMaster to get their platform back and to reestablish themselves and get their house back. Um, so you can see there's a very complex history behind all this and we don't bother you with it. But today I'm gonna bother you a little bit with electronics. Uh, apologies, but uh, I don't know any other way to do this. We keep this stuff hidden from you to make your life simple and easy and fairly pain-free to do neurofeedback. But you say, I wanna do bipolar montage. Okay, well, then you gotta study and you gotta think differently and you gotta do things differently. Personally, I think alpha theta is better than anything for trauma, for theoretical and technical reasons. Um, I know bipolar thing that Seaburn's work using works, but it doesn't necessarily work better than alpha theta and there are no studies to prove it's better and there's no scientific reason to think it works better. Um, and people doing that don't have the technical knowledge to counter argue and have never published a counter argument because there isn't one. But it's the new restaurant now so you want to eat at it and that's fine. Um, maybe all of us who are alpha theters are dead wrong and someday somebody will produce some research to show that. In the meantime, we're getting great results with alpha theta, but if you wanna eat at the new restaurant, then listen up. This is a classical amplifier. Uh, they come in different styles and it's called PNP junction and NPN junction, and there's all kinds of things. It evolved out of something called a diode. And I'm not even gonna get into that because you'll all be pulling your hair out if I do. But quite simply, what happens is a voltage goes in over here on the inside, okay? And then um, it flows down and into a ground, and then you get um, this part here, well, actually they've got the other way around. Um, this is the emitter and that's the collector. And the process is that when it goes through here, it gets amplified and I'm not gonna torch you with the details why or the network theory, but you can see here, here's the collector, here's the emitter, here's the base it's called. And you get a small signal in and because of the network characteristics, you get a big signal out. It makes a small signal big. So you're talking about microvolts and you wanna get them into the millivolt range. So uh, the old fashioned amplifiers in the 70s and 80s couldn't do that. You needed uh, multiple amplifiers connected together in a chain and you kept having to amplify each set, set of the chain bigger and bigger and bigger to get something that you could see on your computer and there a lot of noise got into it. You didn't get very clean signals. So um, what happened is along came something uh, which really changed things, particularly in the 90s uh, a lot was uh, something called an instrumentation amplifier. 
Now we were using differential amplifiers with those simple transistors with lots of stages and it was very messy. But once we got these uh, op amps, they're called, instrumentation amps, we had a gain of 100,000. So now you needed fewer stages in the chain and you got a lot more amplification. Not only that, is that the DC offset, which we've talked about, and if you don't understand, there's a discussion on it on my YouTube video on artifacts. The DC offset was stable, which means that you got much more accurate um, and consistent readings on your computer. Uh, there wasn't much drift. It, it, it didn't change much. You could be sure that the signal was reliable. And of course, it had what we needed, um, common mode rejection. And if you've done the web course, you should know what common mode rejection is. And if you don't, again, it's on that artifact discussion. But um, basically, for common mode rejection, you have to have two inputs two sets of amplifiers. So this is op amp one, this is op amp two, these are stabilizing networks, and this is the output. So you get a little signal in here and you get a big signal out here, and that you can manipulate with your computer. And this is the ground. Everything you notice here all goes to the ground. Ground um, is important because you want the ground of the amplifier to be similar to your ground value, so the values for both have to be similar to compare apples, to compare you and the amplifier to work together, to comparing apples to apples. That that reduces DC offset and drift as well. Um, so we have the active on one side and the reference on the other side in our amplifiers. So all EEG amplifiers have a ground, a reference to one side, of the amplification process and act as the other amplification process. So we're using what we call two op amps and we call this a channel. This could be channel one. On your amplifier, if it's home training, you have two sets of these in your black box. It's called channel one and channel two. If you're using our four channel amplifier, you have four sets of these in there. And all of the um, grounds are linked together. And in our equipment, all of the references are linked together. Now you can manually unlink them, and I'll show you how, but that's the way it's done. And if you're using a 20 channel amp, you have 20 of these under in the box, and they cram them all into a tiny chip. Uh, and uh, then you have, uh, all of the references and all of the grounds on all 20 channels are all linked together. And that's called monopolar because you have all of these linked together and then you have this one active reference which you can put anywhere on the head. So you have this very accurate thing. Now why am I going into this? Because this is where a lot of people get confused. Here is a one, this is, this is one channel here channel one, reference A, and ground. Now, if you have the newer amplifiers, and I just went over this with somebody, and I was trying to explain this to them, and they had a newer amp, and I didn't know it, so we were talking past each other. But this is channel one, reference A, and ground. Now, on the newer amplifier, it says channel one, left ear, and ground. So, note that. Now, for a bipolar montage, you have to use just this one set of inputs. You can't use channel three, two, or reference B, or channel four. You cannot use that for a boatman. You can only use um, channel one and reference A, or as it's otherwise known as left ear and ground. So if you're not doing that, you're not doing bipolar montage. I don't know what you're doing. There's lots of things you can do. Now, typically... Dr. Souter. Yes. Mark Shively, if you can back up to your schematic again, mm -hmm. this to me clarify. No, I mean it's like this is what people gloss over sometimes because it all looks the same. But we do a disservice when you look at a picture of a map and they just have A1 and A2 by the ears because we we use A1 as meaning your your active electrode as well as 
um, uh, you know, sometimes they use it as, oh, that's the ear, but it's not. So here, like you were saying, when you link all the references together and then your, um, your actives are maybe like CZ, PZ, TZ, that's mm -hmm. all your monopolar. Right. But if it was bipolar, your active would be like CZ and then your reference would be like maybe PZ. And yeah. so now you're, you're, you're drawing between those two sites on the head and then the grounds would, would all be linked together. And yes. so that's why you get, and that's in, so that's the big configuration difference. Okay. You but you're going monopolar to, when you link your references okay. all together. You're correct, Mark, but I think you're going too fast for your audience. You know, oh, well, I, so that's, I'm going slower than you, but what you just said, if, if all of you understood Mark, he's exactly right, but I'm going way slower. So I'm explaining it at a really simple level because I teach people all the time every day. And if I explained it to that at that rate, they wouldn't understand. Some of them would, but not everyone. So you're, you're totally right on, but I'm going to go slower on this. So um, those of you who heard Mark, he gave you the quick summary. I'm going to walk through it again slowly. We can say it as many times as necessary. On your amplifier, if you want to do um, bipolar montage, you need to use uh, an ear clip, put it on the ear, and then plug it into ground. Okay. That's, um, and then the next thing you're going to want to do is take a single, a simple lead like this, and you're going to put it, let's say, at T4, and you're going to plug it into reference A or left ear, depending on your amp. And then if you want to do active three, you're going to plug it into channel one. Now, there's nothing sacred about the colors of the wires. There's nothing sacred about the placements. So I could switch these around. I could make this one T3 and this one T4. It doesn't matter. The amplifier doesn't know the difference. Um, but the important thing is that this is how it has to go in terms of plugging things in. Now, what Seaburn does a lot of times is she'll do T4, P4. And I think Mark was just saying the same thing, or PZ. So you could plug in T4 to reference A or left ear, and then you could put P4 instead of T3 into channel one. But that has to be the configuration on our amplifiers. Now there's also, uh, just so you can see, here is the reference at P4, what you're calling the reference, and that would be uh, uh, reference one, or that would be left ear, would be going to P4. And then active would be going to T4, and then the ground to the ear. So that's what the montage is, bipolar montage. And it's all going through just one channel. And this really confuses people because they're they're thinking of the locations on the scalp as the channel instead of thinking of the amplifier as the thing that defines the term channel. The next thing you have to do on our software, and BrainMaster did not do this originally on um, on their 1920 channel amplifier, you know, they and uh, I was like, Tom, how are we going to do? bipolar. He wasn't that concerned at the time because he was doing um, Z-score training and that was really what they were focusing on. But they eventually made a modification internally so you could unlink the ears. Uh, and so when we built our software, we put in a, a, an ability to unlink the ears. So you need to go, if you're going to do bipolar training on our software, you must, I say must, go into this um, this little session control place, go down to the bottom and select unlinked. Because by default, the ears are linked. Our amplifier will not work correctly, okay, if you're doing bipolar montage, unless you unlink the ears. You will not get accurate readings. So hopefully, if you're doing bipolar montage with our with our software and amplifier, you're unlinking the ears and you know that. Now, we've talked about Can that just, part. Yes, uh, question. Yeah, when you um, 
do you set this up um, with channel one and uh, you put the reference into reference A and the ground is the right ear. If you do it the other side, do you switch the ground to the opposite? So it's contralateral if it's for the um, uh, rep? For the... I, I would just for sanity's sake. Okay. <laughs> Technically, the way our amplifier works, it doesn't need to be. But just to keep yourself sane, I would do it that way. Okay, thank you. Now, I'm going to blow your mind even more, because this is what Tom and I sat down and pulled our hair out originally with Sue. Um, and when I presented it at the ISNR meeting, I mean, um, a lot of people like Bob Thatcher, and others, they just got up and walked out, and they said, that's ridiculous. That, you, what are you doing? And I was trying to show them with a brain map and software what Tom and I had talked about because I was trying to help the authors out. And uh, Sigrid and Sue were like standing there going like, oh my God, you know, that they don't get it. And we tried to explain it to them. But what's happening with the authors in the 2001, 2002 protocols, maybe 2003, which led to, in, to, the, to what they're doing now is that they inhibited everything from 1 to 40 hertz so they would go into the brain master and you know delta theta alpha beta low beta high beta every single channel they would make it an inhibit and they would inhibit it 95 97 percent so they were putting a modest inhibit up here on everything and then they had one other filter and it was 13 to 16 hertz and they enhanced that. So they uptrained that at 80%. Now, I still have those original files in my old ancient Windows 7 computer. And then what Sue and Sigrid would do, and people were like, how can you train up and down at the same time? Well, technically, if you're not inhibiting too much down, you can it's what we used to call range training. You can put a threshold a high threshold and a low threshold, and uh, any time you exceed either threshold, so in the wrong way, you don't get a tone, but if you stay in between the two of them, you get a tone. And that's kind of what they're doing here. They're doing a form of range training. Now, this was very inventive of Sue. She didn't know electronically, but she understood, she figured it out. Um, and we never thought of doing it this way. It seemed like, what? But then Tom figured it out. He got out, did the math, scratched the paper, and said, yeah, yeah, you can do this. Okay, so. Um, Martin, yes. quickly. Um, to clarify this very much, this is an amplitude range training, not a yes. frequency range training, just to make that clear. Yes, absolutely. But not entirely, because now we're going to add another curve in, is that they would shift this up training. Uh, it's three hertz here. This is a three hertz window, 13 to 16. They would shift this up and down in half hertz increments, and they would. And as they shifted it up and down, they would look for a sweet spot that got optimum benefit in the client's symptoms and how they felt. And if they got the right spot, they would feel great. And they'd say like, we got it. But when you were shifting up and down, sometimes you would get uh, heart palpitations, racing hearts, giddiness, uh, um, uh, sweating, nausea. So they were at, by doing this, they were hitting um, the, the brainstem pretty hard which was very interesting to me. Um, so they were shifting down, up and down these increments until they got that sweet spot. As the authors did this more and more, they found that they were training people down lower and lower. And at a certain point, they were training mostly up in delta and inhibiting. And eventually, they started going below one hertz. And they went like, well, we seem to be even getting better effects with less side effects. They were concerned because a lot of people were shying away from what they were doing because of the side effects. But they found below one hertz, they got very few side effects and still got benefits. And that got into a whole nother historically big argument between everybody that their amplifier was not built 
to measure below one hertz and they said yes it was and they said no it wasn't and there's all these technical arguments and it went on for years <clears throat> um, this is the protocol that Seaburn was using originally was this shifting up and down with that broad inhibit now she's mostly working down well she still shifts up and down I don't know if she's still using the broad inhibit somebody t told me she was only using the one to six and Judy may know because she's been to the workshops but this is how it evolved and this is the basic overview so you have to set up your software to do something like this so if you wanted to do that in our software for instance you would have to, to, to do to set up one channel like uh, let's see I did FPO2 um, but and I was into FPO2 in another location or I could do a T4 P4 it doesn't matter what it doesn't matter you could put uh, John Doe in here and it doesn't matter because this does not control the training software it's just it's just a marker so you remember what you did so you would train you could put T3 in here and link them up link them up to T3 T4 or T3 P4 or T4 P4 whatever you want you could hook them up so this it's just got to fill something in here to tell the system that you're moving forward and then you could set up increments say here's a three hertz increment at 8 to 11 7 to 10 6 to 9 and uh, so you could train each one of these up in your training channel you just turn off the tone if you don't want to train so you turn the tone on for here oh they're, they're doing not doing so good at 8 to 11 turn it off turn the tone on for 7 to 10 oh they're doing good there I like that that sounds good uh, or you could turn that off or turn the tone on for 6 to 9 oh that sounds good they're doing good there and you're inhibiting 1 to 40 Hertz um, at a 95 percent rate and that would be what the authors were doing in ours we don't have it set up so that you can that you can shift freely up and down I mean we could do that but until there's a large demand for it you're talking about a lot of money and time to change the software for just one or two people um, if you're really excited about um, about doing the auth this protocol then you might want to go to her workshops and use the EEG -er equipment or something similar whatever she's using Richard, if you're having conversation with the person while you're training them, you can start at one of these, mm -hmm. clone the others. Yes. And then pause, talk, go in out of one program into another one that you've cloned. So you can start at 8 to 11, pause, talk, go. You've had it already cloned, and just, that takes like less than a minute to go from one to another. And you I'm can so set them all knows. up right because that must be what you're doing right we are most of the time we're staying on one frequency um, for 20 minutes about but you but I've done this and that's how and then we've cloned a whole variety of them so we can drop as we need to drop yes well what is the inhibit you're using are you using the one I'm six using inhibit? one to six one to six okay. okay so so now she's she's down to using a one to six inhibit instead of one to 40 which is and in her book, she also inhibits 22 to 36. So okay, so she's got a high and a low. That's inhibit. there. If if I see high beta in the QEEG, I'll okay. add that. So that and so that's slightly different from what the author. So she's evolved it. So she's just down training the low end, down training the up end, and then and then doing increments in between to see which one gets the best results, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so now, so now sometimes, sometimes we'll stay at one for a little while, like a two or three yeah. times, and then oh, drop. Yeah. And it's oh, yeah. all what? there's a whole series of things you have to do with the client to make sure that you're heading in the right or the wrong direction. And if you're going to do this using anything with Seaburns, I'm not to interrupt you, but to oh, make please. sure you have Seaburns book neurofeedback and the treatment of developmental trauma as at least a starting point. Mm -hmm. because the ability of what to ask how to determine looking at all the different physiology things that are 
components of the trauma-based fear reactivity is is really critical to what adjustments you're going to make. Thank so, you. Quick question, know, Judy. Well, I've, I've, I've read question. it. Mm -hmm. Quick question. Are you moving the up training window outside of the one to six range, down training mm -hmm. range? Mm -mm. I'm not. So you're only training between one and six hertz up training. Is that correct? I am training one to six down. Yes. Mm -hmm. And simultaneously, what and do you up training? Up training. It could be nine to 12, 8.5 to 11.5. Yeah, Usually I'll start at 10.5 to 13. Yeah, yeah. I knew, I knew I Martin used... would be very interested in this because he's, <laughs> he's talked yeah, about it. He's been doing it already in his own kind of way. Hey, Richard, um, this is Bree. I just want to jump in quickly. It's a little bit of an aside, but maybe not. Um, you and I had a session because on the two-channel amplifier, okay, for New Mind, Bipolar Montage came out looking a little differently. And I just want to know, is, is it appropriate to mention that here? Because I know a lot no. of people have. No, don't, don't, okay. don't. Okay, don't. you got it. Because I'm afraid you're going to cause confusion. But uh, uh, there are other ways of doing this. And I'm just trying to get the basic concept down. So I don't want to confuse people. But no, I got, I got if you're that. Concerned, if you're concerned, just email me. We'll set up a time and review it again. I mean, happy. Right. I want to. But Just basically don't. what you taught us today with this amplifier mm -hmm. may not be appropriate for the smaller one. Is that correct? For the two-channel amplifier? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no. You can do the same thing on the two-channel amplifier. Because you're. Oh, it, doesn't, okay. it doesn't matter what amplifier you're using because you're only using one of the channels. It doesn't matter how exactly. big the amplifier okay. is. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. But I would really listen to Judy. And that's why I said it's incidental and that's why Judy said it's this is part of the training but so much of what she's doing is therapeutic and this is this is uh, it's necessary but it's not the dominant component of her therapy and and uh, if if you want to know more you might want to contact Judy um, if you really want to know you should go to one of Seaburn's go workshops. to Seaburn right I mean I'm telling you she's, but you don't need to go to Seaburn's workshop scheduling she, bipolar yes. Pardon me. I was just yeah. saying she schedules through EEG or and that's how I started was like a case consultation where you just bring something and it's a Zoom with however many four to six people and you start talking about it. And then I went in person, yeah. you know, and um, it's I'm finding it very, very useful for uh, people, for example, that well. We're getting late, and I suppose yes. we want to have well, we'll second have more time level to talk this. about. We're going to come back to this uh, I, next time. Instead of doing proportional, where Rob has me scheduled, I may do part two. Like I said, I know how far I'd get, but I can see Richard? so far we need to keep talking about this. Yeah, Richard, just quick last question here um, on the protocols that New Mind suggests based off the map. All of those protocols then can be done on the one channel, correct? This one channel setup, you can do all those protocols on this one channel setup the way you just went through it, correct? I'm not sure what you're asking. Um, but you might not want to. If, for example, it's protocol 20 and you're doing an asymmetry protocol, you would not want to do O1 minus O2 necessarily. That's going to achieve a different effect than when you do it as a two channel, if yes. I'm understanding the question. That's, that, that, yeah, if, if that's a question, she's right. So let's. Right, I'll, uh, I'll, yeah, we'll go over yeah, it later. We're almost out of time. So, but so that's okay. what we're going to get into. We're going to start talking about, we're going beyond what Seaburn and Zoom, we're actually going to talk about bipolar training dynamics. What's happening when you're training bipolar? Why would you use it? What's the difference? And we have to understand the amplifier dynamics. We have to look at it has a different effect in terms of phase and coherence than you would expect. Um, and we need to know why you want to use them. And then we're going to actually show you the brain is not passive, it's active. And although there's theoretically things it's supposed to be doing when you actually hook somebody up, which nobody ever did, strangely enough in our field until I did it and presented it at the meeting, um, it doesn't. It doesn't act in real time, in real life, 
the way it looks like it should if you're just looking at the theory. So we're going to go over and say, how does it really affect what really happens? You know, what theoretically should happen, what really happens. You rarely hear what really happens. Most of you hear just what's supposed to happen. And that goes on a lot in our field. So um, the next time we get together to talk about bipolar, it won't be for a bit. I have to see what Rob's schedule is. We will finish with this. And, uh, and then we'll get feedback and keep talking until everybody's clear on it. And I know where everybody's getting lost. We're crowdsourcing the, how, the ways that you can get lost. And then we'll put it all into one thing uh, very slowly. So I really appreciate everybody's input. If you're feeling confused or overwhelmed, that's not unusual. Everybody in the field of neurofeedback has struggled with this. It's because if you're not technically trained, it is an overwhelming concept, the difference. Um, you don't need to know this and you don't have to do it. So don't feel like you're missing out. It's not true. You can do two channel protocols. I have people who come from all different backgrounds doing two channel protocols going, oh my God, the results are so fast, they're so amazing. Well, why didn't we find new minds sooner? And that's not me blowing my horn. That's pe people tell me that. You ask our support people. Uh, so two channel is great. The system is great. It works great. It's documented to work great. But there are other things you can do that can give you an extra edge. Bipolar montage is one of them. Uh, and so uh, take it one step at a time. Don't panic if you don't get it right away. It takes a while to sort it out. We'll keep going over it till we find the easiest way to explain it to everybody. And I'll incorporate Mark in that. You can see he, he knew instantly what it is. So thank you everybody for your input and your confusion. And uh, we'll continue on with this whole topic uh, again soon. Time to get back to work though. Have a great weekend. Monday night we have a QEEG review scheduled so far. Okay. So Don't we'll see you then. See you then. Thanks Thank you a lot. Thank, Thank you so much. Have a good weekend. Mono or bipolar. <laughs> 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 well, Thank you.